Sasha Eisenberg, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Let, let's start by having you tell us a little bit just about the, what's the arc of what the Victory Lab is, is about? What's the story? It's about this scientific revolution that's taken place in the world of campaigns over the last decade. Um, two innovations that have given campaigns finally the, the tools, I think, to uh, more rigorously, empirically understand what exactly is moving voters. Um, the first being uh, the introduction of field experiments, randomized trials that have come into politics from academia, from the social sciences, and uh, the other from commercial marketing, all the um, new individual level data that campaigns have access to about, about you um, and their ability to statistically model uh, um, predicting what they, opinions that they think you will have, behaviors that they think you'll, you'll uh, uh, what they think you'll do and what they think you'll, what they believe you'll think. So, you know, what was the, talk a little bit about how you trace the practical applications of this social science revolution through, you know, a couple of, I mean, in some ways you start at the turn of the century, but even more recently, how did you see the applications kind of enter and what got you interested? Yeah, so, you know, political science uh, has lagged behind many of the other social sciences uh, in using, um, uh, field experiments, uh, certainly behind psychology and, and economics. Uh, and so these two guys at Yale, Don Green and Alan Gerber, decide in 1998 that they're going to go out into the streets of New Haven and run a, an experiment. And um, it's a pretty radical thing to do in, uh, in, in their discipline. Um, they conceive a randomized control trial. So this is basically like a pharmaceutical trial, but they want to measure the effectiveness of basic political communications. So they're using voters as their guinea pigs. Instead of randomly assigning people to get drugs and placebos, they're giving them doses of political communication. Then you can go out and measure the individual impact that that interaction had on somebody's likelihood of voting. So they uh, work with the local League of Women Voters chapter in Connecticut, and they set up this nonpartisan get out the vote drive. And they randomly assign voters in New Haven to get one of four uh, reminders. A quarter of them get this GOTV reminder uh, on a postcard. A quarter of them get it uh, uh, on a call from a, a paid call center. A uh, quarter get a, a visit from a canvasser who's a, a grad student. And then um, uh, there's a control group that gets nothing. And then afterwards, they can go back and they can see who voted and who didn't. So it turns out that the people who get the uh, phone calls see no increase in their likelihood of voting. The people who get the mail, there's a, a small but appreciable increase in turnout. And the people who get the in-person visit from the canvasser sees a significant uh, jump in turnout. And so um, they have trouble getting this paper published in, in academic journals. They've uh, made no meaningful theoretical contribution to any of the debates that occupy political scientists. Um, I think in the book I describe it as embarrassingly practical. Um, uh, and yet people in the political world who tend not to pay a lot of attention to scholarly journals uh, take note of this. Um, there tend to be one of two reactions, right? There's, uh, oh, great, um, here are academics who have a scientifically credible tool for uh, disentangling cause and effect uh, in assessing the effectiveness of things that uh, we encourage candidates to spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on every year. And then there's another uh, reaction, which is the more popular one in the political profession, which is, oh no, academics have developed a scientifically credible tool for determining whether these things that we get campaigns to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on every year actually work. Um, and so you get this sort of war of the consultants who are, you know, the, the, the male guys are saying, give us some of the phone budget. Um, and you get the sort of civil war among the specialties in politics. We get a small corner of people in campaigns who, uh, in the political world, mostly on the left in the institutions in Washington, um, who think not only should we be paying attention to the, these experiments um, and learning from what they tell us about what works, but hey, we're out doing politics every day. Why don't we start running experiments of our own? And you start to see um, the development eventually of a really interesting collaborative research culture between uh, academics, mostly political scientists, some behavioral psychologists and economists, and uh, people are out doing the day-to-day -day work of trying to win votes. And that has, has sort of set the terms for, for how politics has learned from sort of empirical field work uh, over the last decade. So what, what was it, I mean, in your memory, and I don't know if you remember this or not, that made you sort of interested in this and, you know, sort of triggered like something that said, hey, this is going to matter. Yeah, so you know, I, um, I've covered campaigns uh, sort of on and off for 10, 15 years. 
um, and I've covered them mostly in the ways that we see them as we consume them through uh, newspapers or, or TV, which is, you know, the goal was, is to sort of stick as close to the candidate as you can. You um, spend a lot of time writing about what amount to fairly minor shifts in language or presentation at speeches and rallies, um, big schedule events like debates, the sort of back and forth between the press secretaries and, and their press releases or conference calls, the sort of stupid stuff that they want you to, to write about every day. Um, and in 2008, I was a reporter at the Boston Globe um, covering a campaign in, in more or less this way, flying around with candidates, mostly McCain, but um, plenty with Obama and Hillary too. And uh, it was only after that race that I realized how limited a view of the modern campaign I was getting, and by extension, you know, and, and all the other members of the press, and by extension, our readers uh, or viewers, um, you know, what I realized, I, I sort of stumbled into this sort of geek subculture in campaigns, uh, kind of inadvertently, um, uh, and I realized that I may have been focusing almost exclusively on what John McCain did on a stage every day, but there were tons of people back at headquarters who thought that they had a lot of other levers that they could pull on a given day to move votes, and that we were only looking at the sort of most public, performative part of the modern campaign, and it failed to understand all the other ways in which campaigns interacted with voters. And it turned out, as I, as I learned, that those were the areas in which campaigns had gotten a lot smarter in the years in which I rather obliviously had been covering them. The people bought TV ads and staged rallies more or less exactly the same way that they did in 1988. Um, everything else had changed dramatically in part because of these experiments, and in part because of the new data and analysis they could do. And so um, I realized that it was a way that, that telling the story of uh, this shift what could help me explain what the campaigns are actually doing, which media coverage is horrible at. Um, could allow me to sort of understand some recent campaigns in a way that, if not totally at odds with the story that's been told, really differs, I think, from the sort of common idea of, of how elections have been won. Um, but also get to this interesting culture clash over the question of, like, you know, how do we understand what is going on in an election? And too often, I think we tell ourselves one big story about the dynamics of an election, where in fact, um, we should, probably should be telling ourselves millions of little stories about individual voters and their psychologies and the effects of small interactions that they're having with campaigns. It's hard to tell that story, you know, and get away from the frame of, well, it's just one or two things, you know, a, a narrative of one or two competing drivers, right? Right, and, and you know, and, and so well, I always realized this was a, a central problem, not just from a, a media perspective, but from the perspective of campaigns trying to understand themselves. And part of the problem with campaigns is they've been sort of resistant to innovation because they're resistant to self-examination. And I, I had an inkling of this even well before uh, the sort of period in 2009 where I, I, I came to understand some of the, these things. Because I always liked the day after the election, uh, the Wednesday morning, because I could call my sources on the campaign, and they'd be a little more candid with me about what had happened, because they didn't really have any secrets to protect anymore. And you'd always have one of two types of conversations. I would call the people on the winning campaign, and, um, ver and I'd ask, so, so what happened? Why did you win? And very quickly, the conversation would become uh, about some discrete activity that took place that, that almost invariably that person was directly involved in, right? So it's like you call the media consultant, the person makes the TV ads, and it's like, what happened? Why would you win? And you get this story that's you know, a week out. We were down, so I looked really closely in the polls. We were like just like getting slaughtered with married women. So I tore up the, the media plan for the last weekend. I rushed into the studio. I told the, the director, I just want to make this last ad all pink. We're going to go shoot the candidate in front of a house with a swing set. And we made the ad overnight. We pulled down all our other ads. We rushed it to the studio for the last weekend. We just ran the pink house ad wall to wall. Um, by election day, we closed the gap on married women. We squeezed it out. And then you call like the communications director, the speechwriter, and you hear the story about that one line that they told in that radio debate that totally changed the terms of the conversation. And you go talk to the advanced person who sets up the events, and like you hear that six weeks out they made some brilliant decision to like stop going to diners and only go to pumpkin patches. And like by the end we'd killed it with the pumpkin patch vote. <laughs> and you call the losing campaign and you say like, what happened? Why'd you lose? And 
all of a sudden it's like the candidate sucked, she wouldn't raise any money, it was a horrible year to be a Democrat, the economy was bad, and you realize the campaign was incapable, nobody in the campaign was capable of honestly taking credit or attributing blame, and by extension had no way of learning from their successes or their failures. And, you know, because campaigns are basically the worst company you could possibly imagine, right? So like, here's a startup company that exists for like six or nine months. They care only about market share on some random Tuesday in November. Whether or not they succeed, they go to business the next day. Um, the person who's the, uh, you know, at that point, everybody scatters, the consultants are on to the next thing, the candidate, uh, I mean, rightfully, if they win, is back to governing or planning a transition. If they lose, is on a beach somewhere feeling sorry for him or herself. You know, that, the candidate who's like the CEO or chairman of this business is always somebody who's either done it before, in which case they know everything and is going to do the same thing again with the same people, or they've never done it, in which case there is absolutely no good reason why if you are a city council person or a justice of the peace, you should have any idea how to run a multi-million dollar political marketing corporation when you first run for Congress. And so they're totally in hock to people who, whose every incentive is aligned to do the same thing over and over again and not ask any questions about whether or not it works because there's no way that they can be held accountable afterwards if it doesn't. And they're looking to squeeze the most income out of the campaign. Yeah, and there's, they're either competing. I mean, you got either one of two dynamics, which is equally unhealthy. You know, so a campaign has a bunch of specialist consultants, and sometimes there's a general consultant who sort of runs the traffic among them. You know, so you have the person who does the mail, and the person who does the phones, and the person who does the web ads, and the person who does the TV ads. Um, and uh, either they're competing with one another for share of the budget, um, uh, in which case, Almost every strategic question becomes a question of like mode of delivery. So you sit around the table and you ask, like, what should we do? And the TV, ad, TV guy always wants to buy more TV ads, and the mail person always wants to send more mail. Um, and so they basically always have to think that what they sell is the solution to whatever problem a campaign faces. Or um, if you, you know, the happy scenario, which is like, does not create for any more healthy and intellectual environment is that they basically are a cartel that reforms around a different candidate every two years. And so it's like, you know, I'm the mail guy and I'll bring in my friend the phone guy and I'll bring in the TV guy. Nobody really wants to challenge one another because we know how we split the pie and we can, you know, convince this candidate to do what we tell him is best. And then we'll just go on together and, and um, I'm avoiding using the words con and mark here, but like, you know, like, there's no reason why you would engage in a small turf battle for another 3% of this budget because it's much better to know that, like, we have a good relationship. The next time you have a, uh, you know, race in some other county, you'll pull me into it. And so, you know, campaigns were immune to any honest self-examination. And they last, nobody in a campaign reasonably wants to invest in any sort of research that's going to yield a lesson in sure. December. And it became very hard. Even these experiments, um, no campaign wants to take voters out and put them in a control group and say, we're not going to talk to these people to learn a lesson in December. And so the places that bring innovation into, um, into campaigns are institutions that have a longer horizon. They're either academics that are pursuing academic questions that end up inadvertently being useful for politics, or they're institutions like you know, the AFL-CIO ends up being a big character in my book. Um, they're around year after year, and they actually want to get 3% smarter for next year because they're going to spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars on politics. And um, they actually invert the leverage, and consultants want to please the political director of the AFL because there's a lot of money next year and the year after if they're the, the sort of chosen pollster or whatever. And so um, when those institutions start to say, hey, we like these tools from academia to actually test this stuff, um, their consultants were in the position where they, they couldn't blow them off. Uh, I, I'm interested in the fact that one of the entities you don't mention, and you talk about this in the book, uh, as providing continuity or kind of sustaining the energy for innovation are the parties. It seems to me the, you know, that one of the, one of the negative spin-offs of that creation of a, of a, of a consultant class yeah. and this cartel is that it also weakens the parties. Right. I mean, you know, like parties, and part of it was um, McCain-Feingold's 
weaken parties because they just had less money coming in and, and um, were, were less players. But one of the things that uh, is that there's actually just not a lot of continuity at parties. Um, you know, we're, we're in a moment now where, I mean, especially if, if Obama wins in two weeks, where you will have had a incumbent president who now has continuous control over a party. But you look at the RNC over the last six years, and they've turned over chairman uh, three times, each time in what was seen as some significant rebuke of the prior regime. Once they come in, they clear out a lot of the top and middle level people. Often this is taking place within the cycle of a presidential campaign when the, when the new nominee is able to sort of stock the party with their people. And so um, there's often not a, uh, uh, an interest in uh, investing in long-term research projects or the continuity to pull them off because um, often the chairman feels the need to satisfy a lot of short-term interests. You know, one way in which parties, I think, um, you know, and, and, we, and I think there's a lot of talk about uh, how with super PACs they'll be marginalized in, in new ways. The one way in which they remain uh, uniquely relevant, I think, is as repositories of data. Um, which now people are seeing the value of a single entity maintaining data year to year because one of the most valuable things that you can have in targeting voters is a knowledge of the past contacts that they've had with canvassers or callers. And so, you know, um, if you, voter X, told a canvasser for, for John Edwards in 2004 that, um, you know, global warming was the most important issue to, to you, that's actually really useful in, uh, uh, in certain races, especially in, in primaries or um, races that sort of cut in interesting ways across the parties, because that's a really good set of soft data. And the only places that that exists are often the, the databases of the parties that bring that stuff back from the campaigns. Now, a real specific question about that, um, and I wanted to ask you about this when we were at lunch earlier. Um, in your reporting, how have you seen the, man the relationship evolving around these, the, the management and the access to these databases between the national level parties and the state level parties because anecdotally I've heard a lot of complaining by the state level party in Texas about the control of access to the van and to these major databases that the national party or the Obama campaign or some yeah. entity at the national level has and that the state party badly wants to get their hands on, whether it's the actual data or the tools. Yeah, so I think it's different within each party. I mean, traditionally, Democratic state chairmen um, uh, have been more powerful uh, with regard to the, the national party than Republicans have. I, I, as best I can tell, the origins of this were that at some point Republicans started paying the salaries of like the executive directors of the state party and stuff, and they just had a lot more leverage. Um, probably goes contrary to everything we think we know about their interest in national centralization and whatever else. But um, so you know, one of the things that happened um, that explains I think an early advantage that existed through 2004 that the that Republicans had in data collection and, and what became micro-targeting was that Republicans built their first national voter file, which is a, a single database of voters in the country, by 1990, um, a project they had started in the late 70s. And it was uh, uh, an incredibly arduous process because every state and county had their own thing. And in some places, you know, you had to physically go to the county courthouse in every single county in Montana every time they updated their new registration records or who voted in a primary and get the paper and bring it over and then actually enter it in the computer. There are these stories which, um, you know, you, you have in, in New Hampshire and Maine and Massachusetts, each township controls their own voter list. And the, there are these stories I would hear about that the, that the basically the registrar of elections would be uh, uh, somebody who kept the list, the voter roll on a blackboard in their living room. Um, and so it was a huge amount of like drudge work for the party to do this, but it wasn't a big political problem for them. When Democrats started um, between 2000 and 2004 deciding, uh, uh, under Terry McAuliffe, who was the chairman, deciding that they wanted to create their own national voter file, they had a huge political problem, which is each of the states had by then, over the course of the computer era, developed their own very robust database, and it was, um, 
really valuable. Some state chairmen would, ch would sell it um, to vendors or consultants, and it was one of the big fundraisers that they had um, because they had all those past contacts. Right. Um, and it was also a way for them in primaries that's one of the reasons that if you're the endorsed candidate in a primary, like what is that worth in, in you know, 2000? Um, well, one of the things is that if you can deny challengers access to all this information the party has on voters. And so that made the chairman and, and the chairman's circle very influential in, in, in sort of factional politics. And so it was a big hurdle, and the Democrats had to basically buy out um, all of the states to get them to play in. There's a different dynamic now. There's a reason that state parties hate Obama, um, which is that he has decided that he's going to run his own operation, which has been the, you know basically in 2007. Well, so so we, we've had these structures called coordinated campaigns, which was basically a legal structure that was developed first in the late 80s by Democrats and Republicans and mimicked. And the idea was, as people saw the value of um, data collection through volunteers and focus more on uh, getting out the vote in a sort of systematic way, um, people realized, hey, in our state this year, we're running a presidential campaign and a gubernatorial campaign and a Senate campaign and a bunch of state legislative campaigns, and we're all Republicans, so let's not be redundant and have five different people knocking on doors in the same precinct asking are you, who you're voting for for president, who you're voting for state legislator. Let's sort of divvy up this job of talking to voters and then bring all the data together. Um, and then when it's time to mobilize, we'll take all the people who are good for the whole ticket and we'll uh, sort of assign the get out the vote responsibilities for them. This has worked pretty well for both parties, um, especially um, now that they have less money under after the end of soft money. Obama decided in 2007, because he got through the primaries without the support of most party organizations, that he didn't want any part of this. And um, now they now he's running for re-election in a few places where they have good relations with the state parties, they do this. But in most places, they run a parallel operation. And that um, annoys uh, county chairman and state uh, party chairman to no end. Yeah, I've seen direct evidence of that here. Um, I want to move on to Texas a little, a little bit. But I, before we do that, I want to like, close out on one more topic here, because we've got a lot of students here and a lot of people that are working either in offices and likely to work in campaigns. We were talking before we started about the way that the changes you talk about in the book have kind of changed the culture of campaigns that will probably be conveyed forward through young people and through the people that are getting experience in these campaigns. Can you talk about that a little bit and give us some examples of what you mean by that? What are, what are people working in campaigns now getting used to that yeah. they won't go back on? So um, you know, I think one of the enduring legacies of, of the 08 Obama campaign, regardless of what happens in, in two weeks, will be um, a real change in the kind of talent uh, that is running campaigns day to day. And so um, basically, by dint of Obama's charisma in 2007 and the fact that that campaign was always growing and always hiring more people, um, it just sucked in people from uh, who had no experience in campaigns, but had very interesting backgrounds and skill sets outside of campaigns. And and to go back to what I was saying before, like almost every instance where campaigns innovate is because uh, uh, there's some sort of interplay with the outside world, whether it's academia or commercial marketing, and there's a kind of challenge to conventional thinking about how you solve a political problem. And so you get these people who are just streaming in initially often to volunteer for Obama, and then they end up getting staff jobs, often very junior ones. But they just have like amazing resumes or CVs. And so you know, in my book, I have two characters. Um, uh, both of whom had studied econometrics. Uh, one was a graduate student at, at, um, at Berkeley at the time, who uh, stumbles into a, a, an Obama field office before the California primary, which Obama sort of only half-heartedly contesting. And they've made this odd decision that they're going to open up the van, which is the sort of voter database, to anybody who uh, signs up as a local field volunteer, I guess one of the neighborhood team leaders. and. Um, so this guy who had developed econometric forecasting models all of a sudden has access to all of this voter information. And he starts messing around with it. Um, and interesting things start to happen. Um, another guy uh, 
who'd been a, a student at University of Chicago, also studying econometrics, had gone on to work for an economic consulting firm, um, hated his job, was kind of intrigued by Obama, had never worked in politics before, ends up in, a, in Iowa as uh, initially the voter file manager, I think was his title, um, uh, spends a few weeks uh, fixing word on people's computers because he's the only, he's sort of seen as the tech guy. Um, but eventually he's given a stack of these uh, supporter cards, which uh, the campaign is now sort of with these pledge cards has made a national thing. But it's a real, in, in Iowa, because of the caucuses, people are used to voting in public. And so there's a culture of getting people to sign their names and promising that they will caucus for somebody. And so this was sort of the currency that the campaign collected when they went out and, and found a voter, said, OK, sign the supporter card. And so at one point, the, the director of the uh, Iowa operation throws down these cards on the desk and says, enter these into the van. And eventually, he's building game theoretical models, playing out what happens at a caucus, because you have this bizarre system, which you, probably, you guys probably forget about every three years and then remember. But in Democratic caucuses in Iowa, um, people don't only vote uh, uh, in public, but there are these weird thresholds where you need to cross 15% to qualify for a delegate. Um, and he builds out these uh, this bit of software um, called Caucus Math that they load onto laptops and they give to their local person, and caucus captain in each place, that guides them in each possible situation how to deny Hillary delegates, which is their top strategic objective. And so it guides somebody who has no idea of math or anything else in what places you know, we, the Obama campaign, should throw three people to Edwards and one person to Richardson, and when we should try to cut a deal with Kucinich. Um, and uh, that's something that no traditional like person who'd worked on campaign after campaign would ever think of as the solution to that. They would have thought that you go find like the oldest person who's been to the most caucuses in Indianola, and you make them your caucus captain, because they'll remember what they did for Babbitt uh, in 88. <laughs> And his solution is like, let's actually solve this as a real problem. And that guy's now the, I always get their titles confused. He's either the data director or the analytics director. His name is Dan Wagner of, of the reelection campaign. And he is you know, one of the six or 10 most important people in the political data world. Um, and it was a sort of freak. Uh, of his career and of the Obama campaign, that he ended up in that position and that the Obama campaign kept on growing and giving, having the opportunity to give him more responsibilities. Um, and that is a, um, you know, and he's going to be around doing interesting things in politics for a very long time. So new roles and new opportunities if you're, if you're just sort of in this thing. Yeah, I mean, poli politics, routes. you know, that everything I said, or sort of said before about the like, pathological insularity of the consulting profession also means that it is ripe for people with expertise solving problems in other areas of human experience to apply that knowledge and skill to politics. Because the people who come from politics are not, are very rarely encouraged or emboldened to question the old assumptions. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the difficulty is, and this is where I think a presidential reelection is really different, is that a lot of people who have real skills are not going to leave their job to go work on a campaign for four months not knowing, you know, uh, you're going to leave your job at Google or your tenure track position job at, at MIT to go work for four months on a campaign not knowing what happens on November 10th? No, probably not. But if you're a presidential reelection and you know you're going to be around for two or three years and you can offer somebody a real job for that time, like it starts to become interesting to people who are drawn to the candidate but also see the possibility to do some real research in, a, in an environment where um, you know, if you're interested in working with data, there are very few places in, in the United States other than you know, secret intelligence gathering programs that we're not allowed to know about where you are manipulating data about 200 million American adults at the same time, making predictions about their behavior. Um, and so campaigns are kind of an amazing place if that's the type of thing that you want to deal with. There's a couple of Texas, Texas campaigns play prominent roles a couple of episodes in the book. Talk a little bit about those two. Maybe start with, you know, how, how did the George W. Bush campaign figure into this story? Yeah, so you know, 2000, um, at the time, people thought of as like the lowest stakes election in like the history of the world. Um, you know, like peace and prosperity, like 
you know, no urgent crises. Um, and, you know, the end of that campaign has been overshadowed by obviously the recount, and then nine months later, September 11th, and so um, the campaign itself tends to like be really minimized in our memory. I think that it's been incredibly influential in the political profession. And that's because two things were revealed to us in 2000 that can totally dominate um, campaigns. The first is uh, it's when we realize how totally polarized in ideological and partisan terms um, the electorate in the country were. And so I, I write about Matthew Dowd, who was Bush's chief polling advisor, uh, an Austin resident, um, uh, I believe an alumnus of, of this institution, um, who starts working on a memo even before the Supreme Court has ruled in Bush v. Gore, laying out a, a strategy for the Bush re-election. And um, he dwells on one. Uh, piece of data in the exit polls, which was something like, I'm probably going to get the numbers just off, but that in 1984, 26% of people had split their tickets uh, between the, uh, at some place on their ballot voting for a Democrat and a Republican, and that uh, by 2000, it was down to 7%. And what Dowd said was, we can no longer think of elections uh, just as this sort of uh, effort to win over swing voters in the middle, which if you think back to the way people talked about campaigns in the 90s, was like the dominant paradigm for understanding what you did. But we need to uh, focus on mobilizing people who are on our side but are not regular voters. So we need to be better at individually identifying them and pinpointing them, and we need to be much better at motivating and mobilizing them. And then the other insight, which is connected but was revealed um, in Florida, was just that elections could be decided around really small margins, which um, uh, allowed people in the political world who might have otherwise scoffed at the idea of investing millions of dollars to solve small incremental problems about efficiency or effectiveness. Um, to take that stuff seriously. And so a lot of the stuff that I write about in my book, either on the experimental side, it's, it's about finding some way to improve your canvassing script or your phone program to get one point or two point or three points better. And on the data microcharging side, it's figuring out how to be more efficient by three points or 3% or 4% or 5% in sorting through voters. Um, that might have been something in the mid-90s somebody would have laughed at and said, wait, you want me to do all this work for one or two points? And after Florida, that no longer seem like a, a silly way of, of, of thinking about um, campaigns. And so the Bush campaign, the reelection, ends up um, uh, on the, at least on the sort of pinpointing and identifying voters in your coalition uh, problem, making major strides um, through uh, what, what we now call uh, micro-targeting. Okay, and then overlapping that story, at least in time a little bit, is the Perry campaign that, you know, picks up after Bush leaves the state to go to Washington, D.C. Yeah, so, um, so in 98, uh, Perry uh, basically gets a new general consultant and top political advisor, this guy named Dave Carney, who lived in New Hampshire, had some limited experience in Texas politics, but Bush had told Rove uh, uh, as basically in the beginning of 97, as the 98 campaign approached um, in Bush's re-election for governor, and then looking ahead at the presidential campaign, you can't work for anybody else. And Rove was obviously a big deal in, in Texas Republican politics and had to cut off all of his other clients that year. And so Rick Perry went shopping for a new political advisor, and he found this guy, Dave Carney. And Carney had been um, uh, he uh, come of age politically in New Hampshire, working for John Sununu. Um, ended up uh, working on Bush's, George H.W. Bush's New Hampshire campaign in 98 and moved into the Bush White House and by 31, I think, was the political director of the Bush White House. Um, and then afterwards, he became uh, what was known as a, a general consultant, um, which meant that he was kind of at that table of specialist consultants. He sort of played the role that a uh, 
a uh, contractor will play at a construction site. So the same way that the contractor will bring in the plumber and bring in the carpenter and kind of make sure that everybody is doing their job, the general consultant would bring in the mail guy and bring in the phone guy. And so these two experiences, having been political director of the White House, where you basically spent all day on conference calls with consultants running like candidates around the country who are all begging you either to send Dan Quayle to their state or not send Dan Quayle to your state or whatever they, they cared about. Um, and then being at the center of this, uh, these sort of consulting tables for candidates, he developed a real suspicion about the consulting profession. Um, and a version of the critique I mounted earlier, he was really concerned with the fact that people were paid whether or not they won. He found this to be um, uh, like a grave affront to the idea that their goal should be winning the race for the candidate. Um, and he also really chafed at the problem that he had no way of honestly, it was his job to, uh, to arbitrate those debates where the TV guy would say, let's put more money on TV, and the mail guy would say, let's do more mail. And he felt like he had no basis for refereeing um, that debate. There was no way of knowing what actually worked. And so in, um, we jump ahead, uh, Perry becomes uh, governor uh, right at the beginning of, of 2001. He runs for his first full term in 2002. And at the end of 2004, um, uh, Carney stumbles upon this book that those two guys at Yale, Don Green and Alan Gerber, had published at that point, anthologizing um, what was probably already hundreds, but certainly many dozens of experiments that they or their grad students or what had sort of become this diaspora of people running poli-sci experiments um, had done. And they put together this book that was supposed to be written for a general audience of people who actually do campaigns. Um, Carney read it uh, on a flight from Manchester to Austin. To, he was coming to meet with Perry to start planning the uh, 06 re-election. And by the time he lands in Austin, he's decided that he's going to email these guys, uh, Gerber and Green, and give them an offer that they, um, in some very abstract way, had been hoping for for a while but never thought would come, which is, he says to them, I'm getting ready to run a gubernatorial re-election in one of the largest states in the country. I'm going to spend $40 million. Um, how about you come in and uh, run some experiments here? And they'd had a problem because they had been relying on a university research budget, a human subjects review board approving all of their tests. And um, occasionally, they collaborated with groups that were operating under a part of the nonprofit tax code that allowed them to mobilize voters, but they couldn't actually do partisan work. And so they'd been through in a lot of nonpartisan get out the vote registration projects, but they'd never been in a real partisan candidate campaign because they couldn't actually spend nonprofit money doing partisan persuasion work. And so Carney's offer is anything that this campaign does that you can successfully design a uh, uh, credible experiment or test around, you can do. And so Carney relishes this moment where, um, and I describe this as a scene in the book, where he has, there's the, the Perry people have their sort of regular planning session for the, for the campaign where um, it's all the consultants and sort of the extended Perry political family, his friends, and sort of top donors and advisors, and Anita. And um, uh, Carney unveils these four guys he's brought in that he calls the eggheads, which are the two guys from Yale. And then they bring in two Republican political scientists, one of whom is Darren Shaw, um, uh, more or less because they want cover because they're going into a room full of Texas Republicans. And there are two guys from Yale who had done um, a year or two earlier uh, experiments with ACORN. Um, uh, and Carney says, these four guys are going to I've given them freedom to test anything you do. And he loved it because he thought it was finally a way to audit all of these consultants and vendors who he thought had been um, selling him stuff that he couldn't measure before. And so they um, used this license to test stuff that um, we have had no, basically no other way of measuring uh, in an empirically credible way. Uh, who, who, which we have not been able to test, which is um, the really big stuff in campaigns. And so for three weeks in January of 2006, they randomly assign all of Perry's television and radio buys across 18 of the 20 media markets in Texas. Um, uh, and for several days, they randomly assign Perry's travel. Um, and so for the better part of a month in the midst of a gubernatorial campaign that everybody is covering as though Perry's going to Lubbock because he 
needs to be in Lubbock, and he's putting 750 points on on TV because in in Corpus because strategically that's what he wants to do. In fact, it was randomization software on I think Darren's computer that was making the decision um, uh, about that for the sake of this experiment. And they, um, uh, you know, the the punchline now. It took six years for this punchline to pay off, but. Um, you know, Rick Perry has probably made a larger contribution to uh, the academic study of political science uh, in the United States since I think any politician since Woodrow Wilson. And there's certainly more journal articles that were incubated in that campaign than in any of Wilson's. Right. So, so Rick, per <laughs> Rick Perry's intervention in higher education. Now, as a follow-up to that, I've got or one of them. Uh, we can edit that out. Um, I've, I've got to, uh, I've got to follow up on that and ask you what you think of Carney's success in Texas since then, though, because his last couple rides here have been pretty rough. Yeah. So, how so, do you kind of assess Carney's role in that? I mean, what do, what do you make of that, just more broadly? Yeah, you know, and, and I don't know enough about the sort of dynamics of the Dewhurst race to to weigh in on it that much. I mean, I think Carney, Carney was a, a great character because, um, and first of all, he's an incredibly smart guy and he has all the right skepticisms that are really rare for a political professional to have about the, the environment in which he works. And, um, and I think his genius was being able to, in a business where people get by on selling a lot of certainty, on acknowledging not just in particular situations that he didn't know, but that there was a central crisis of knowledge among the wise people of politics that they actually did not know anything. And um, that is, uh, there's nothing outwardly about Dave Carney that screams humility, but there's a certain type of intellectual humility to that, which is really rare in that profession. And he loved the confrontation that he was engendering with these eggheads effectively auditing the thing. But at the core was him saying, I mean, he went to Perry and said, look, I want to bring in these political scientists that you've never met um, and, and give them basically the keys to the car because I think there's a lot that we can learn about how to run campaigns in Texas. And that's a pretty radical thing. Now, does that translate to every tactical or strategic move he's made is, is brilliant? No, not, not at all. And he'd run a you know, a, a bunch of losing campaigns before this and, and run them since. And I think the one thing they've learned is that there are limits to the, how much you could transfer lessons from experiments that were run in a particular context for a particular candidate in 2006 um, to other situations, including running for president in Iowa or running uh, a different lieutenant governor for, for governor in Texas. You know, one thing, uh, just like a cautionary note, which I think applies to all of this and, and everything else, is that um, uh, you know, all this stuff is stuff that affects races on the margins. And you know, one of the sort of pathologies of the political profession has been that you know, when you're in a winning race, everything you do was brilliant. When you're in a losing race, everything you do was stupid and everybody in it was dumb, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but it's, if you think of campaigns as only about big strategic decisions, then of course you're going to come to those conclusions. And there are a lot of races, I mean, maybe David Dewhurst would have lost that race by 40 points if Dave Carney hadn't been so smart, right? Um, uh, um, I'm sure he'd agree <laughs> yeah. with that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the but the sort of the, all of these insights from experiments or sort of use of data for more refined modeling are things that change races at the margin. And you know, I, Todd Rogers, who's a behavioral psychologist, ends up being a sort of central character in my book because he starts running these experiments with this sort of secret society think tank on the left called the Analyst Institute. He'd go around to groups encouraging them to collaborate on experiments, and he'd always say, "There's a lot we can learn from this, but." We can't change the overarching architecture of a race. So if you have a bad candidate or who's right, running in the wrong moment or their party is unpopular, they have positions that are not liked or um, they're, they can't remember things in a debate or whatever it is, like, we can't fix that. That has nothing to do with that. And at some point, you know, this process of making campaigns smarter doesn't mean that you can turn somebody who's just ill-suited for the moment, as I imagine we'd all agree in retrospect, having the Dewhurst was um, as right for it. For somebody who didn't follow it that closely, you, you, you came to the conclusion that I think a lot of people yes. would agree with. Um, one last question before I went up for Q&A. Um, 
to bring it into the present. You know, the book bounces back and forth innovations on in both parties over the arc of this period that you've kind of implied. And we didn't talk much about the Obama campaign and what they did. I guess a little bit in front. But as we look at it right now, how do you see the state of the campaigns? Is, is, is one party, is one of the presidential campaigns, you know, particularly advanced, doing better at deploying this stuff than the others? What's, what's it look like right now? You've been, follow, you've been covering yeah. the campaign. So the Obama campaign is, as best I can tell by almost uh, any, in almost any category of sort of innovation or technique ahead of Romney, and the left is generally ahead of the right. And so um, I, can, I think I can sort of explain this structurally for two reasons. One is for the same reason that the Bush campaign in 04 was able to, you know, have four years to go from that Dowd memo laying out a big problem and a set of discrete uh, uh, sort of innovation or tactical uh, uh, research projects that they wanted to embark on um, and largely did. Um, the Obama campaign also is on a four or five year research arc and it allows you to sort of bust that cycle of six months or nine months of, of building up a business and then it goes away and nobody learns anything. All of a sudden you can um, start to think uh, like a Fortune 500 company and lay out a real research and development agenda. You can start to hire people from who have expertise outside politics. You control a national party for four years and you can use all these local races um, as uh, for testing, trial ground, staging areas for every little thing you want to do. Um, and so um, they're benefiting from that significantly. Romney, for all the smart people are in that campaign, even in the best case scenario, they'd have six or nine months to uh, to match that. And you, in six or nine months, you can make a lot. You can do a lot of focus groups and do TV ads and put them on the air. But you're not going to start laying out a, a research agenda to, to question some underlying assumptions about how campaigns can work or what you can measure. The other big thing is that <clears throat> I do think that the big gains to be had uh, for thinking in new ways about solving political problems through that 2000 to uh, like maybe 2005, 2006 period were, came from people in politics looking at the corporate world and commercial marketers for guidance because they had collected all sorts of data about their customers and had much better ways of tracking their relationships um, and starting to make uh, uh, predictions about individual consumer behavior. And so a lot of what politics was doing through that period that um, uh, sort of con uh, culminating in the Bush micro-targeting stuff was, hey, how can we translate that to politics? I think the big insights in the last five to six years are coming out of the social sciences, particularly experiments. Um, and that's a place where um, there are a lot more, the, the Darren Shaws of the world are, are uh, really rare. You know, um, Republicans with Republican academics who are interested in working on or with or around campaigns, who have real methodological expertise and know how politics works. And there are a lot more people of that stripe on the left. And so there are graduate students who are studying with, with Don Green and Alan Gerber and their sort of diaspora all over the country who want to go work with Emily's List or the League of Conservation Voters or state democratic parties. There are very few. Uh, comparable uh, uh, people coming out on the right who want to work with the NRA or, or Republican parties. And um, that's a place where I think that the sort of sophistication and ambition of the research agenda on the left is um, sort of gone so far ahead of where the right is um, that that will take a while um, for anybody to, on the right to catch up. I think with that, I want to open it up for questions. Please wait for the microphone. And if you would, just sort of introduce yourself to Sasha. So Dave right here, if we'll bring the microphone over in one second. I think someone's got to grab the microphone, though. I'm David Edwards, and I teach in the government department. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is, do you think that it's these sorts of things that have made Obama's campaign more effective than anybody thought in such bad circumstances it could have been. And the other, specifically in relation to Texas, the biggest, really the biggest sort of question about the future of Texas politics, I think, is uh, Mexican-American turnout. 
are there ways in which this sort of approach is being used or could be used to try to f find ways to maximize uh, or dramatically increase that? Yeah, and so um, on the first count, frankly, Obama's, the biggest Obama successes this year have been um, very good messaging and negative ads against Mitt Romney that frankly have nothing to do with the stuff I uh, have written about. Um, and are, um, I think that they have some sort of sophisticated like qualitative research tools to test their ads and stuff, but basically they were just good at being ruthless in all the rich guy stuff. Um, where we should reprise this conversation in two weeks, the, the real test of, and not just because we'll see the result, but because we'll actually see whether their ability to identify and mobilize their coalition, historically underperforming parts of their coalition, that'll be the real measurement of their technical prowess. And you know, the Latino population um, uh, nationwide will, is one of those groups. Um, you know, specifically, we've seen from all these experiments where there's a pretty good body of work on how to motivate people. Um, and it's almost all, almost all the good stuff is informed by research from the behavioral sciences, um, a lot of which had its origins in psychology, was demonstrated in other aspects of human life, um, occasionally demonstrated in lab experiments in some form or another, but now is finally being translated into politics as it is practiced. And so there are now, um, and the left has been much better at collecting and synthesizing this research and distributing it out down to local candidates. And um, that there have been, a, um, you know, we know a whole lot of what are basically psychological tricks or nudges that increase somebody's likelihood of voting, none of which have to do with the individual candidates or the issues, but all with um, sort of changing the sort of social dynamics around voting. So I'll, I'll briefly tell a story of, of, of the most fun of them, um, which is also happens to be the most successful tool we know for turning a non-voter into a voter. So in 2006, in this experiment in Michigan, um, <clears throat> these uh, two guys from Yale have been talking about uh, Green and Gerber, partnered with a local direct mail vendor. They randomly assigned voters to get one of several different messages, and one of them said something like, uh, Dear Jim, your history as a voter is a publicly available document on file with the Travis County Board of Elections. Here's your history as a voter. You uh, did vote in last year's Senate election. You did not vote in the school board election. You did vote in the presidential primary. You did not vote in the mayoral election. And here are your neighbors' vote histories. And had other people on your block and whether or not they had voted in those same elections. And then there came a threat. Um, there's another election coming up. And afterwards, we'll send everybody an updated set. Um, and this increased turnout among the people who received it by 20%. Um, and it also got the guy who sent it death threats. <laughs> and um, both of these facts in convinced the people who were running the experiments that this idea, which psychologists call social pressure, um, applies in politics, which is um, people want to live up to uh, the sort of what they see as the standards and norms of their community, letting people know that something that they thought was private, like everything having to do with voting, actually can be made public, that they can be sort of surveilled and judged based on whether or not they live up to, to that standard. Um, and so there's been an effort uh, underway in campaigns to figure out how you can harness this psychological tool without the death threats. Um, and now there's a, a, a bit of language that the Obama campaign uses widely um, <clears> that will say something like they'll send out letters or they'll use this in scripts where they'll go to somebody who as, you know, and this is, um, uh, you see in a lot of underrepresented populations, people who vote in 2008 but haven't voted in any election since then. And it'll say, instead, it'll say um, something like, uh, Dear Jim, I can see you voted in the 2008 election, and I wanted to thank you for having uh, been a voter. Um, there's another election coming up, and I'm hoping that once again I can thank you for your good citizenship. Um, and these are techniques that, you know, what's really amazing about them is that they increase turnout not by the 20%, but by several points. And, you know, they're not talking about Barack Obama or Mitt Romney. They're not talking about the DREAM Act. They're not talking about what a Republican, Republicans controlling the House and the presidency would mean. They're all about, in, in this case, um, you know, through a little bit of a, a, a casual threat, an implied threat, 
um, changing the psychological social dynamic around voting and playing to somebody's desire to fit in and not stand out for having done something wrong and being judged by their peers. And so that there is a, a body of research that the left has done a better job of un understanding and exploiting that they are hoping, and we'll see um, by numbers in a couple of weeks whether they've been successful, but that they feel are really helpful at motivating people in a way that doesn't rely on them being uh, conventionally enthused about the election as a, as a choice. We have time for another question. I'm going to ask you one more question. Will you bring me that thing, too? All right, so we've, we talked about this at lunch a little bit, too. So in the end, I mean, one of the things that's interesting from the personal perspective in reading the book is you seem like, you know, you came at this in a very, from a very traditional kind of angle. I mean, it seems like you entered this in the way that you told it, being a 12-year-old engaging in kind of labor-intensive politics. Yeah. And now, you know, we come to this full circle where you tell the tale and you end the book on, on, a simil on that tale to some degree of people getting letters in the mail, you know, deploying a subtle psychological threat that really has nothing to do with the candidates on the table, right? So, so what's, your, what's your sense of the upside and downside for the political system, for the way politics works? Good, bad, what's good, what's bad? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot more good than bad. I mean, the, the few bad things, which I'm like, I think they're sort of contingent bad things, but, you know, I'll give voice to them. I think people have every right to be concerned about privacy, both for, in the consumer space or the political space, and I think, you know, it's good that if people are going to be aware of what information exists about them and be skeptical of, of the motives of people for collecting it and selling it on. And to the extent that, that you know, information that was initially gathered from the world outside politics is being used for politics to be you know, sort of skeptical of that. Um, and then the other fear, which comes along, I think, with a inaccurate representation of what micro-targeting really is and how it is used, is there is some fear, which is reasonable, that candidates would use it to have a different conversation with every single person in the room because I know, you know, that each of you care most about some totally pick a you niche issue and now I can um, uh, just communicate with you on that and campaigns are no longer about you know, big, broad, inspiring, thematic, unifying things, but are about lots of people being uh, told issues of really parochial interest. Um, uh, this, and sometimes, you know, theoretically being told totally dissonant or conflicting things uh, that represent a candidate as being on different sides of an issue because they think that I can tell 10,000 people I'm pro choice and 10,000 people I'm pro life and they'll, you know, I'm doing it in the mail or doing with target web ads and you never know. This very rarely happens, mostly because most elections, voters tend to care about the two or three or four same things, you know? You don't have to look too closely at polls now to realize that, you know, it's like 60% of people are saying that jobs or the economy or however they're defining it are the, their most important concern. And so I can micro-target the hell out of this room and I'd still realize that probably three out of five of you would want to hear something about what I'm going to do for job creation. So, um, uh, so I think that's a reasonable fear. It just doesn't really bear out in, in practice. The good stuff is, one, all of this data, which we didn't talk a whole lot about, but which allows the campaigns to come up with an individual level prediction of your likelihood of voting, of voting for their candidate, of take, having a certain position on an issue, <clears throat> is all in the service of them wanting to know more about you so that they can meaningfully interact with you on the stuff you care about. Um, and uh, campaigns were always trying to persuade you in potentially manipulative ways, but they just had to do it, when they did it through mass media, they were so risk averse because the fear of alienating somebody by being specific enough on an issue that people could disagree on um, was so great that they just wouldn't talk about them. So you had, you know, like, just really, uh, it was really hard for candidates to go positive on controversial issues. Um, and so either they would go like gauzy, generic, like, you know, um, 
no possible offense could be taken on it, or they would go really negative because that stuff actually does work pretty well universally, and the people you alienate are people you want to alienate, right? Um, and so now I think campaigns can, knowing, ha having a sort of more granular understanding of who you are and what you care about, meaningfully interact with you on the issues of your concern. You are no longer trapped in the geographical lines or demogra large demographic categories that campaigns had to use to target you through the 90s because the, most of what they knew about you was what, how the precincts you lived in voted or the information on your voter registration record, which is like your age and your gender and, and uh, um, uh, where you lived. And now they can find three people on a block that they want to mo motivate, mobilize. They can find four people on the block that they want to persuade. And it doesn't matter if you are a Republican in a Democratic Fortress precinct or vice versa. Campaigns can see you as part of their plans um, because they can individually pinpoint you and they can go out and through uh, individualized voter contact, mail, phone calls, door knocks, web ads, start to have a real conversation. And so um, I, that, that's encouraging. And I find that all the stuff that's come out of these psychological experiments have developed just a more honest, nuanced understanding of how campaigns can engage people to do something that they uh, aren't inclined to do otherwise. I and mean, we tend to ask this question always the wrong way, which is, why are there so many people who don't vote? Like, well, the better question is, why are there so many people who do vote? Like, most of the time, your vote doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know, I apologize. It's an unromantic thing to say. But like, um, it's like you know, political scientists have had a lot of trouble for a long time explaining why 55, 60% of people do vote. And every explanation they've had until these experiments came along bore no uh, relation to the reality that any of us have when we uh, wake up on that Tuesday, or I guess you're in an early vote say when you wake up any day before that Tuesday and have the opportunity to decide whether I want to you know, drive somewhere and wait online for half an hour to do this. And so um, you know, these long equations that political scientists have come up with, it assumes that the moment you wake up on that day, you're deciding the likelihood that you're going to be the pivotal and decisive vote in a, in a choice in which like 100 million other people are also making their own calculations times the possible material benefits that would accrue to you if the side that you vote for wins and there's a change in power and they're able to implement their agenda. Like that's insane, right? <laughs> and yet people voted anyway. And what we're starting to realize through these experiments that on the margins can, are changing people's likelihood of voting through these very small behavioral interventions is that people are voting because there are social benefits to voting. They want to see themselves as a voter. They don't want to be judged by their peers as not being a voter. And I think there's a desire to read that as manipulative or cynical. Um, frankly, it's just it's an honest understanding of the human brain. And it manages to connect with people and extend to them benefits of voting that they um, weren't experiencing otherwise. And if those benefits are a desire to fit in or feel good about yourself, like, great. Like, I'm, like to me, that seems like a perfectly good use for, um, for, for the political profession. And so you know, I think there's this desire to look at modern campaigns and say, that, like, they are superficial, and they don't respect the intelligence of voters, and they don't in any way um, help to build meaningful uh, uh, agendas for governing. And like all these things are true. Um, and we should blame the candidates, and we should blame the media, and we should, you know, we should blame the candidates for, for being risk averse and cynical and bad. Um, and we should blame the media for not challenging them in, in reasonable ways. And we should blame voters for being uh, dumb and consuming the worst types of political media about races. But I find like a desire to blame the mechanics is a total cop out. You know, our politics were, our campaigns were really silly um, decades before micro-targeting your experiments. And uh, it, it's a it's a deferral of blame that each of us saddle in some way or another for the quality of our campaigns to pretend that like the computers did it. <laughs>